in which the world is perceived to have become more hostile to U.S. interests as its foreign policy objectives have encountered fierce resistance beginning on September 11th, 2001, if not before. Trump has effectively mobilized frustration and fear against external enemies such as ISIS and radical Islam more generally, and at internal enemies such as undocumented migrants, whom he describes as drug dealers and rapists. The effect of Trump's rhetoric has been to create, particularly in his rallies, we have just uh, evidence of a rally in Albuquerque the other day where there was a lot of violence, which has been uh, a theme of some of his rallies, um, and an environment in which his supporters are encouraged, perhaps even exhorted to engage in transgressive action against protesters, who in many cases have been minorities. This panel intends to try to shed light on the Trump phenomenon by drawing upon the rich resources of psychoanalysis and social psychology. There are a number of questions that were posed in the, uh, the write-up that we had on uh, the website, but I'll just leave that now, and we'll go to uh, our first speaker is John Abramite. I'll just introduce him on Skype. John is a, an associate professor of history at the State University of New York, Buffalo State, and author of the book Max Horkheimer and the Foundations of the Frankfurt School. So, go take it away, John. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, well, I'd like to thank um, Samir and the Institute for Humanities for inviting me to participate. Um, and if at any point you can't hear me, just let me know, okay? So I'm gonna read my paper. Uh, and this is my first time doing this, so hopefully it'll, it'll go well, okay. Uh, in my remarks today, I'd like to place the recent success of Donald Trump within a longer historical trajectory of fascism and right-wing populism in Europe and the U.S. After I provide a brief historical overview of the social and social psychological factors involved in the rise of fascism, I'll discuss the decline and reemergence of right-wing populism in Europe and the U.S. from the end of World War II to the present. First, I'd like to discuss the historical and social psychological conditions that emerged in the 19th century, which set the stage for the rise of fascism in Europe. 19th century Europe was characterized by increasingly assertive liberal, democratic, and socialist movements, which were all opposed to traditional authoritarian conservatism. These popular movements from below created a crisis among traditional conservatives. One clear expression of this crisis can be found in the French writer Gustave Le Bon's influential study, The Crab, which was published in 1895. Le Bon presents his study as a modern day version of Machiavelli's The Prince, written specifically for conservative elites who are trying to maintain their power in the new age of mass democracy. Le Bon's recommendation to these elites was mass deception. He realizes that conservative elites can no longer afford to be openly anti-democratic. They must play the game of democracy by learning to manipulate and mobilize the masses in a way that ensures a favorable outcome to their own interests. Writing just a few years after the astonishing popular political success of General Boulanger in France, Le Bon emphasized the importance of a strong leader who could use specific psychological and rhetorical techniques to cow the masses into submission and support of conservative politics. Ten years later, the idiosyncratic French socialist theorist Georges Sorel came to similar conclusions about mobilizing the masses in his Reflections on Violence. Like Le Bon, Sorel believed that politics was an essentially irrational affair and that whoever best understood, quote, the feelings that move the masses to form into groups, end quote, would win control of society. Both Le Bon and Sorel were convinced that the rational political debate celebrated by liberal Democrats and reform socialists was no match for the irrational power of myth to consolidate political power. Although Sorel spent most of his career on the left, it's not a coincidence that he flirted with the new right-wing populist and proto-fascist groups that were emerging in France in the wake of the Dreyfus Affair. Nor is it a coincidence that Mussolini was an avid reader and admirer of both Le Bon and Sorel. One could argue that Mussolini's fascism represented a combination of Le Bon's idea of elite manipulation 
with Sorel's idea of populist mobilization. For fascism's success relied on precisely these two elements, namely a genuine, spontaneous grassroots mobilization, but also the willingness of powerful, entrenched conservative elites to cooperate with right-wing populist movements from below. In Germany, one finds a clear articulation of the crisis of traditional authoritarian conservatism in the work of Carl Schmitt in the 1920s. Like Le Bon, Schmitt realizes that conservatives must learn to play the democratic game if they want to retain power. Like Mussolini, Schmitt was an admirer of Sorel, who realized that the myth of the nationalism, with its roots in 19th century liberal and democratic political movements, had more popular appeal than the newer socialist ideal of internationalism. Schmitz returned to Hobbes and Rousseau in order to develop a bottom-up theory of absolute serenity, express the powerful conservative revolutionary forces slumbering in German society in the 1920s, which would soon emerge triumphant out of the ruins of the Weimar Republic. The uneasy alliance between Hitler, who had succeeded in harnessing the spontaneous right-wing populist movement in Germany in the 1920s, and Paul von Hindenburg, who represented entrenched anti-democratic conservative elites in the military and big industry, opened the door for the Nazi consolidation of power in the mid-1930s. In terms of the social psychological conditions that made fascism possible, I would like to gesture to the path-breaking work of the Frankfurt Institute for Social Research in the 1930s, and in particular to the writings during this time, Max Horkheimer and Eric Fromm. Horkheimer and Fromm both pointed to the emergence of, a new, of new character structures and new class divisions in modern capitalism, which supplied the necessary conditions for the rise of fascism. Horkheimer examined the conflict in modern political theory between the liberal emphasis on self-interest and the republican emphasis on virtue or moral duty. He argued that the former theory expressed the emerging hegemony of the bourgeoisie, whereas the latter expressed the sacrifices that would be imposed upon the lower classes as they were integrated into the new capitalist order. As long as these sacrifices were rewarded by concrete social gains, as was the case in the French Revolution, Republican virtue was defensible. But the sacrifices demanded of the lower classes lost this justification when it became apparent especially after the July Revolution in 1830, that the promise of liberty, equality, and fraternity would not be realized by the bourgeoisie, which had abandoned its erstwhile allies from the lower classes in their common struggle against the aristocracy, and had itself become a new particularist power. Furthermore, the ongoing imposition of the ascetic, self-disciplined bourgeois character structure upon the lower classes, which was accelerated by the Industrial Revolution, led to increased levels of repression and sacrifice, and along with it, increasing resentment among the lower classes. New forms of social cohesion and new forms of compensation for these sacrifices had to be found. Drawing on Freud's early drive theory, Horkheimer and Fromm emphasized plasticity of libidinal drives and the ability of imaginary forms of compensation, such as membership in an imagined community or the imaginary love of a powerful leader to partially satisfy, satisfy repressed drives. In this context, Horkheimer and Fromm also emphasized the transformation of nationalism in 19th century Europe from a liberal democratic justification of rebellion against the ancien regime to a chauvinistic justification of social Darwinism and imperialism. They also highlighted the links between chauvinistic nationalism and compensatory sadism. With its Manichaean friend-enemy logic, chauvinistic nationalism sets the stage for violent attacks on demonized uh, members of the outgroup. In this context, such attacks provide compensatory satisfaction of repressed libidinal drives, but also provide narcissistic gratification by affirming the perpetrator's membership in the imagined virtuous community and the approval of the powerful leader. Many of Horkheimer and his colleagues' studies of the historical and social psychological origins of fascism in Europe were carried out during their exile in the United States in the 1930s and 1940s. It's important to recognize they did not believe that the, United, that the US was immune to the powerful authoritarian tendencies in Europe that they had observed and analyzed. In fact, 
The Institute carried out two large-scale empirical studies of such tendencies in the US in the 1940s. The first was a little-known study of anti-Semitism among American workers, which was never published. The second was a much better um, Studies in Prejudice, which was published in five volumes in 1949, including the famous study that was co-authored by Theodore Adorno, The Authoritarian Personality. Both of these large-scale empirical studies were motivated by the question, could it happen here? Could an authoritarian movement similar to European fascism succeed in the United States? As Horkheimer makes clear in his introduction to the Studies in Prejudice, the members of the Institute did not think that the historical and social conditions in the U.S. in the immediate post-war period were conducive to the emergence of such a movement, mainly because fascism in Europe had so recently been defeated and discredited. Nonetheless, this conviction did not stop them from carrying out these studies. Horkheimer and his colleagues were convinced that the powerful social and social psychological tendencies which had led to fascism in Europe in the 1920s and 1930s existed in all modern capitalist societies and continue to exist even after the defeat of fascism. They were convinced that if social conditions change, these, condi these tendencies could reemerge. In the little time that I have remaining, I would like to suggest that social conditions have changed in the past four decades in ways that have enabled the reemergence of powerful authoritarian and right-wing populist tendencies. During the two decades after the Institute published the Studies in Prejudice, Europe and the United States experienced an unprecedented economic boom. The remarkable prosperity of the 1950s and 1960s was accompanied by the growth of an effective uh, social state and strong trade unions that redistributed wealth and ensured the security of most, but certainly not all, citizens. And in, doing, and in so doing, minimized the anxiety and resentment that had fueled the rise of authoritarian movements in the past. A broad Keynesian consensus existed, even among conservatives like Eisenhower and Adenauer, which led to a significant redistribution of wealth downward. The economic downturn in the 1970s and the transition to neoliberalism in the 1980s and 90s reversed these trends. In the 1980s, Reagan, Thatcher, Helmut Kohl, and even the socialist Francois Mitterrand in France adopted business-friendly policies and sought, more or less vigorously, to put into practice the new neoliberal economic consensus. These tendencies were only reinforced by the collapse of the Soviet Union, which led neoliberal ideologues to triumphantly proclaim the end of history, that is, the proof that there is no alternative to capitalism. In the 1990s, American Democrats, the British Labor Party, and Continental Social Democrats also jumped on the neoliberal bandwagon. Reformed and unreformed European communist parties, which had remained popular in Italy and France in the post-war period, also entered a period of terminal decline during this time. The main point I would like to make here is that this transition to neoliberalism also coincided with the emergence, as the Dutch political scientist Cass Muda puts it, of a whole new family of right-wing populist parties in Europe. For example, the rise of the Front National in France corresponds more or less directly with the decline of the Communist Party and with the shift to the liberal center of the Socialist Party in France. Several sociological studies have demonstrated that many Front National voters have migrated from the Communist Party. Other right-wing populist parties in Europe, such as the Freedom Party in Austria, have also risen to prominence based on the popular criticisms of neoliberal globalization and of the mainstream social democratic and conservative parties that have pursued such policies. What is most striking about Donald Trump, in my view, is the way he has set himself apart from other candidates in the Republican primary by breaking with their neoliberal economic policies. He promises to put an end to trade deals, such as NAFTA, which have cost thousands of workers their jobs. He promises to defend and expand Social Security. He promises to rebuild America's infrastructure. And just a few days ago, he said he would transform the Republican Party into a workers' party. Just imagine, the National Republican American Workers Party. <laughs> Trump combines these pseudo-socialist uh, policy proposals with all the techniques of the American proto-fascist agitator that Horkheimer and his colleagues studied in the 1930s and 1940s. Other speakers on today's panel will discuss these techniques, so I won't elaborate upon them here. The final point I would like to make, however, is that the 
a large portion of the blame for the growing prominence of right-wing populist parties and movements in the United States and Europe needs to be placed at the feet of democratic, labor, and social democratic parties that continue to cling to fail, failed neoliberal economic policies. If these parties don't reach out to the people who should be their constituents, if they fail to articulate a critique of capitalism and to develop robust policies to counteract the damage that neoliberalism has already done, it should come as no surprise that their constituents will be easy prey for right-wing populists who mendaciously promise to address their problems. Thank you very much. Thank you.